Hey, and welcome to today's College Sports Communicators live webinar. We are pleased to offer this session on building a winning student staff. This is the first in our CSC Building, Developing, and Empowering Your Staff webinar series, which will take place this academic year. Thanks for joining this important discussion as we discuss how to go about identifying, hiring, and developing a student staff. I'm Adam P. Ledyard, the Assistant Athletic Director for Communications at East Texas Baptist University and a member of the CSC Professional Development and Continuing Education Committee. I will serve as the webinar moderator today. Our presenters are from divisions, different divisions in the NCAA and NAIA, and they are here to offer their thoughts and expertise and will take your questions. We welcome your questions at any time. Just place them in the Q&A function of this Zoom. You can use the chat function to comment, but please use the Q&A channel only for your questions. As a reminder, we are recording this webinar, which will later be on the CSC website and YouTube page. You can watch it on the demand session there. We'll also offer it on numerous podcast channels. Please invite your current CSC colleagues to listen and watch this too. We've got lots to cover, so let's get started. We appreciate you joining us today. Now let's meet our panelists for today's seminar as they introduce themselves. We're going to start over here with Bryant. Thank you, Adam. My name is Bryant Gray. I'm the Director of Athletic Communications at the College of Coastal Georgia. I've been in that role about seven months, and we have about 15 to 20 student workers here on our staff at CCGA. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Gutierrez, uh, the Assistant Sports Information Director here at WPI. Um, we have a uh, head sports information director, Rusty Egan, that uh, is makes up our two-person office. We have roughly 20, 24 student workers that are at hand as uh, we take on the, the seasons here at WPI. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia Frizzi. Uh, I'm an assistant director of athletics communication at Ohio State University, um, entering my fourth year there now full-time. Uh, we have a staff of about uh, 16 students uh, that I help manage. Uh, alongside Gary Pettit in our office. And I'm Adam Ledyard here at ETBU. I'm in my 13th year at ETBU. I've got four graduate assistants slash interns along with 20 plus uh, student workers. So now we're going to dive into our, our session today. And first of all, how do you find your student workers? Uh, I'll open up quickly with what, what I do is a lot of times is I collaborate with our education side here at school with, with communications in the kinesiology department, building relationships with them. When I first came here 13 years ago, there was no relationship. And as I've built it over the years, now they send me students every semester to do their internships uh, in our department from anywhere from creative to helping on game days to behind the scenes stuff. Uh, the kinesiology department sends over interns to learn about just everything in athletics for their degree. And then I also use our student portal uh, to, to find students as they apply on the work study area and to uh, go through there and, and look who best fits our situation here. So that's how I find my students and a little bit of word of mouth too with uh, students saying, hey, I've got this friend that can take pictures or do this. And then we build up that way. So uh, Let's head over to uh, to Alex. Talk a little about what you do to to find your students. Yeah, so this marks uh, year four for me at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. For those that missed that earlier, uh, but yeah, so been pretty fortunate. Started out our portion of the student staff with just two people, uh, the student photographer that reached out that was just interested, and I was able to, uh, uh, I guess, persuade him into getting into the traditional uh, SID. Uh, form and working on our broadcasting efforts um, and some graphics and then sprinkled in some photography and uh, a brother of of uh, another student worker was able to get me in contact with a, a first year coming in that marked my two first student workers here at WPI and now we're up to about 12 with our broadcasting crew um, but yeah that's been basically all word of mouth and then uh, partnering up with clubs around campus. Uh, the photo club has been massive for everybody that wants to get into the media side um, and then broadcasting as well with the radio club. 
uh, they have a few uh, connects that, you know, for those that want to get on the uh, calls for our WP Athletics contest, they've helped out over the years too. And uh, yeah, we've just grown more and more every year. And we have a student fair the day before uh, the first day of classes that helps out the newcomers, transfers, and everybody to find us, ask the questions, and then go from there. Brian, you're at a small NAIA school. Tell us how you get your students to come work for you. Yeah, we really have to grind to get students at um at Coastal. We really utilize the new student orientations in the summer, uh, whether that be freshmen. We do have a couple transfer uh, orientations that we utilize there. We set up tables, uh, we do handouts, um, and then a little word of mouth there as well as as somebody gets that handout and they say, "Hey, this kind of looks like fun. Maybe I'll go tell my friend." Uh, so a lot, lot of word of mouth, a lot of, lot of orientations, and then we utilize our student athletes a lot. So. Let's say for basketball season, we'll use our softball girls or our, our men's and women's tennis teams will help out here and there. And then when during the crossover, when they're both playing, we kind of we kind of split ways. So, you know, basketball will help at softball and then softball will help basketball, so, so on and so forth. And then when basketball frees up, you know, they help out for the rest of the spring sports. So, yeah, the student athletes, we utilize the orientations. And then, you know, sometimes students even come up and they're like, hey, you know, I, I love taking pictures, you know, I. I did stats at my old school. I had a girl come up to me and said, hey, I did stats in my old school. Can I do it here too? I was like, absolutely you can. So, um, yeah, it's just a lot of word of mouth, a lot of orientation, and um, student athletes help out tremendously here. Emilia, you've got a different situation there at Ohio State. Tell us how you work with your and get your students to work there. Yeah, I would say um, a lot of it is the same as what was mentioned before. Um, we have a lot of students who come through and recommend the job to either their siblings who are coming through Ohio State or their friends. So we'll get a lot of a lot of word of mouth there. Um, we're fortunate enough to um, partner up with our uh, journalism school and offer a uh, certificate in sports communications now. This has been about um, five or six years now in the making. Uh, and we actually help partner with one of the classes and we'll come in and do guest speaker um, visits and talk about things like game notes, um, feature stories, you know, statting, all that kind of stuff. So with that, um, we actually, well, we hope to get um, students that come out of that class uh, and want to work for us. And then with that, having a little bit of experience and knowledge of what we do. Um, so we lean in a lot on that program and those professors there to kind of pass along um, our student link. Um, and then hopefully, you know, with that, we get some kids who know what it, what it is that we do um, and are kind of invested in pursuing a career in uh, sports communications. So once we hire these students, uh, what's the next step in that? How do we how do we schedule them? How do you get them to work and, and show up and everything like that? Uh, Brian, why don't you tell us a little bit of how you schedule your students and what you do to communicate with them? Yeah, we have a um, staff-wide group meet that we utilize um, as soon as the kids fill out their paperwork, get hired by HR. I, I put them in our group. Me, I have a message pinned at the top saying, "This is my expectations. This is this is what we're going to do for the semester." Uh, here's my phone number, and then they can text me that way as well. Um, but scheduling wise, we really don't have that luxury. Um, I kind of need all of my all of my workers to work all the games if possible because we have so many roles that that we're responsible for here. Because it's not just not just the communication side for me, it's not just stats and then, you know, social and writing the story. Like we worry about the live stream. We have to have somebody producing that and watch and make sure we have a replay. So kind of, kind of have to have all hands on deck, um, you know, and if we do have to schedule, if somebody does have to miss, then um, I try to have more than necessary. So even if they do show up and then, so I'll, I'll let my student athletes have the, that time off because I know they've been practicing and been studying. So I'll kind of let my traditional students that wanted to work, I'll kind of let them have first priority if that makes sense. But, you know, if a couple of them can't come, then I'm going to need all hands on deck. I'll piggyback off that with you too. I use group me with my workers, put them all in there and make sure they know what's happening. Uh, you know, these are the dates that we have home events. This is when we're working. Uh, if somebody gets sick, they put in there, Hey, I can't work today. Can somebody cover my, my, my shift that I'm going to do at the game. Uh, and then uh, we also uh, put in there like, hey, this upcoming weekend, we've got events coming up. Can can anybody work this event or things like that? And then uh, we also transitioning over to uh, Google and Google Docs. We 
I put the, the schedule together in Google Docs and then uh, put that into GroupMe for the students to use. So talk a little bit about uh, the Google side of it. Alex, why don't you tell us a little bit of how you use Google? Yeah, so at the uh, beginning of each term or right before uh, for us here at WPI, we have a four term schedule. So A, B, C, and D. Um, so for in the preseason uh, time of the year, we list out all of our home games um, from uh, the first seven weeks or so of our competition, along with any other campus events. That way I, I can look ahead and see what other directions these students are going to get be pulled in on certain days so that way I can kind of plan ahead in that sense but all of our home games so that way they can check off their availability and I go you know probably every two weeks where I pick people and try you know it gives me a good visual to spread hours out uh, if I'm you know fortunate enough to have enough student workers but in some cases you know like the others here you know we kind of need everybody and everybody that's available so um, and I kind of going from there, I take those people in their availability and, and send them a calendar invite. Uh, I've been fortunate, you know, for the most part to a lot of student workers, uh, don't forget that they have to work. <laughs> so being able to put it in their calendar has worked. And, uh, I kind of lay like a, a note at the bottom of the calendar invite for everybody's roles and what they're doing, what time they need to be there at the venue, what time they need to set up by, uh, we we've transitioned to you know flow sports this this semester or, or this year so there's a strict schedule that we have to stay on with them so uh, kind of having everything mapped out that way everybody has you know a clear um, sense on what is going on you know leading up until a game day before we shift to Amelia to talk about it we remind everybody to put their questions or their questions in the Q&A section of the seminar so we can see, answer all your questions. But Amelia, talk a little about how you use Google. Yeah, so uh, kind of similar to others, um, we'll put our whole schedule in Google. Um, but from there, that's where we also assign um, our, our games to students. So uh, we kind of put the games on one side and then they fill out under their names in a different column, just all the games that they can work. Um, we go by and we schedule probably month by month. Um, so at the beginning of the month, we'll assign students based on the availability in those columns to the right, uh, just what games that they can work um, or that they're able to work. And again, we'll do that kind of month by month. And that's uh, primarily where we keep our scheduling. But in terms of reminders and messaging, um, we've started to utilize Teamworks. Um, all of our sports now at Ohio State have to use Teamworks. So we figured we'd, you know, jump on the bandwagon there. Uh, we message through there. Um, and we also assign um, our events through there. So we're able to add the two or three students who are assigned to maybe a soccer game on Friday, we're able to put them on there. Um, and we can set reminders to be, you know, two hours before a day before. Um, and we also have the ability available, or sorry, the option to um, put in other events that um, maybe we need students to RSVP for. So whether it's, you know, press box set up on a Friday, we'll put that in on all of their calendars um, and they can go in and RSVP so that we know who's available to come by and help us with that. Um, so we use a couple different things, but uh, primarily, yeah, it's the, the Google Docs and Teamworks that um, help us with our scheduling. So once we've hired everybody, scheduled them, one of the biggest things that we run into is training student athletes. How do we get them ready or training students uh, and student athletes that work for us to get ready for those game day responsibilities? Alex, tell us a little about how you train your workers to get ready for the games. Yeah, so at this point in time, it really shows kind of who your your veterans are in your student worker group, because uh, if they're solid enough, they could train your newcomers or uh, maybe that's their perfect time to knock the rust off after, you know, a summer of not having any games or anything to worry about. Uh, but basically, I mean, for both of our, you know, student groups, you know, with our stats and uh, public address group and then our broadcasting group, it kind of uh, we use scrimmages and preseason practices, inner squad scrimmages to use those times to um, get our practice in. Uh, get, you know, acclimated back to how we set up everything and navigate through the press box, uh, which is very important. Uh, everybody kind of needs to, you know, have every or uh, have experience in every role. Uh, that way, you know, when it comes to somebody that's coming from class and is only going to make it 20 minutes before the game, maybe we have somebody else fill out the PA script for them with starters or 
uh, set up the stat laptop and get that rolling. That way we save time um, during pregame. And then, you know, for the people rolling in hot, that way they can, you know, be ready to go once the first whistle blows. But that extra training really helps us uh, get right. And then uh, overstaffing for the first few games. We, we did that this year, uh, probably, probably a little bit more than normal, just to have the newcomers uh, be able to shadow and see everything live uh, as it's being done, which is a little bit different, a little more chaotic, uh, a little more fast paced than a, a scrimmage during preseason. But uh, it really gives them a good feel for how to be prepared for the game when they're on their own. Brian, over where you're at at the NAIA level, uh, how do you train your students and, and get them ready to go for your for your sporting events? Yeah, well, luckily for my situation, we don't have any fall sports. Um, some may say that's a double-edged sword, but I think it gives me a little more time to uh, get to know my student workers and get to train them a little bit more. Um, and we're starting to hit basketball really hard. I know we don't start – we don't have our first home game until November, so um, – you know, we're really trying to hit stats hard. I try to find who has that interest because, I mean, I'm not going to put somebody on stats if they're just going to hate the job and then not want to work for me in two weeks. So I try to fill it out, see who likes what. Um, and then when you find that, I schedule the training sessions. Um, I actually have one coming up in a couple of days. Um, and what what we kind of do is, like, I, I'll kind of throw Presto up on a big screen and kind of go through, you know, how it looks, how it works. This is what you're looking for. Um, I know there's a ton of resources on the CSC website, especially for like calling stats. Um, if you're looking for that, um, I'll have them go look for that. Um, listen to how people call. I'll tell them how I like to be, what I like to hear when I'm putting stats in. I like what I like to listen for. Um, you know, just teach them what to look for, what to listen for. And then when they have all that knowledge, we try to uh, utilize scrimmages when we can. I know not everybody will have scrimmages coming up before the season, but you have scrimmages, that's a great time to get some students on stats. When it doesn't really matter if they mess up, it's not that big of a deal. You can kind of work through that, see where they messed up, what they missed, because especially basketball is very fast paced and it's easy to miss stats with basketball. So, and then, you know, if you don't have that luxury, we kind of just throw them in the fire, especially for, you know, camera operators like a production team, you know, they're not really going to have that many opportunities to produce a live stream except for, you know, our first game. So you kind of, you kind of just got to learn, learn as you go. That's kind of how I learned. Um, I mean, I really had like a week to learn stats before they put me in there. And, you know, you just kind of got to go with it. I mean, you got to live with what you got. We got what we have. And um, I mean, it gets done in the end, but you know, you got to, you got to utilize what you have and then train them the best way you can. I'm right there with you. Uh, when I interview the students, I find out what they like, what areas are their strong areas. If it's, working uh, statistics, if it's running a camera, if it's wanting to do social media uh, and different things like that, and then put them in that area to work instead of saying, oh yeah, you're going to do stats. And then, then they do a terrible job at statistics. So it's, it's seeing who and what they're good at when you put them in and you get your student workers and what their passions will be. And that helps a lot and makes game days a little bit easier too, knowing that your students working want to be there and love what they're doing. Uh, Emilia, why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about your student workers and their and what they do? Yeah, um, so we kind of start off our year just with um, a general meeting with you know all the returners and the newcomers. Um, we have a handbook that we give out to our students that at the beginning has um, you know just general protocols um, for student workers um, within our kind of external areas, whether that be marketing, digital, photo, video, or communications. Um, and so in there, you know, it goes over things like dress code, credential policies, kind of things like that, um, that they can refer to throughout the year if they have questions. Um, and then in that handbook, we also include um, what likely they'll see in terms of responsibilities on game days. So for each sport, we list, you know, the venue, where to go when you get there, um, dress code that's uh, expected for those matches, um, and then just kind of a basic outline of some things that they might be um, asked to do so that they're not completely surprised that they get there if it is their first time. Um, I'll kind of re reiterate what the other uh, panelists said. We also utilize scrimmages, especially for things like volleyball um, that require a little bit more practice um, before you can really start to call or stat. Um, so for example, you know, this past weekend, we hosted a tournament that had, you know, two matches uh, for three days uh, over, or 
two matches on each day uh, for three days. Um, and one of those matches was a neutral site game. So uh, we were able to have, um, you know, our uh, SID for women's uh, volleyball, who wasn't necessarily as busy during the neutral site game. Uh, she was able to call and we had a couple students at each of those games kind of listen and um, kind of learn from there. And then eventually then for the uh, match that was uh, featured Ohio State, you know, Maria could do her uh, normal SID uh, job that she does during the game. And some of those students were able to hop in and call and um, others were able to kind of watch and just get some real time um, experience uh, just without maybe so much pressure. Um, so we definitely utilize those scrimmages a lot. Um, and then as you know, it was kind of already mentioned, um, we will overstaff uh, for those first couple of games or events. Um, we like to, um, if we can't necessarily overstaff, um, we'll pair up an, a newcomer with a returner so that they can kind of show uh, people where they're going. We, um, I had mentioned it earlier, but things like our football press box setup, uh, when we have all of our students uh, work in uh, football games, you know, we utilize that first setup of the year um, to go through and give, you know, a stadium tour of all the spaces where they may, may be expected to, you know, take stats to or um, places that we might need them to go during the game so that, you know, on game day when things are crazy, um, they're not kind of running around looking for where they've got to be. So, uh, yeah, we utilize a lot of those kind of practice environments um, to help uh, set up our students for success down the road. We want to remind everybody, again, to put your questions in the Q&A part of it so the presenters can see these questions throughout the session. Uh, sticking with Amelia, tell us a little bit, you know, about the the pecking order there at Ohio State, because everybody's going to come in and say, hey, I want to work the Ohio State football game. But do they get to work the football game right away? How do you use that order to move ahead in year one, year two, and earn those spots to, to move up in the responsibility? Yeah, um, right at the beginning of the year when we kind of bring um, our new student, you know, roster together, um, we'll send out um, kind of just like a survey to everyone. Um, and we won't include, you know, the basketballs and football on it, but kind of have them rank, you know, one to eight or one to 12 of um you know, sports that they would like to work with. Um, and so with that, um, you know, obviously it's pretty much all hands on deck um, for football. So um, isn't necessarily a pecking order with who gets to work those games, um, but there is a little bit more uh, responsibility given to our returning students on game days when it comes to, you know, maybe uh, our returners are the ones who are transcribing the quotes from Ryan Day and you know, starting quarterback and one of the other coaches that are brought up in a press conference and maybe the others are taking uh, stats down at the end of each quarter and things like that. So um, while there might not be, you know, necessarily a pecking order for um, who gets to work uh, football games, there is um, just uh, different responsibilities for people with different experience. And obviously uh, throughout the year, as people um, progress and learn what they're doing, um, they have the opportunity to, you know, take on more responsibility there on game days. But uh, when it comes to, you know, other sports, we like to assign people to sports um, based on what they're interested in, just because as was mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it helps to have students there that are interested in what's going on. And I think in our experience, it definitely helps with retention of students when they're kind of doing things that they want to do. Um, so we try to match them up with um, sports and events um, that they have some interest in. And then uh, that also goes hand in hand with what we have them doing um, in the office during the week, uh, working with some sports that maybe they know a little bit more about um, just because uh, it makes them more interested in the work. And it also, um, makes things a little bit easier on our end, just in terms of maybe explaining certain things to students um, when they take on those projects. And we want to remind everybody too that training students, there is a CSC on demand section just for stats training webinars to go in there to, to show your student athletes how to train and use statistics. Now, moving over to office work, some of these students will work in the office. Alex, tell us a little bit about, you know, your your schedule of how you have uh, students work in your office area. Yeah, so we've had to get pretty creative with how we utilize our student workers and their schedules, um, especially, you know, student athletes that have, you know, practice and, and games of their own and then times to just be a student as well. Um, this kind of office work and remote work in some cases, uh, student structure has been very helpful as 
you know, maybe it's something as simple as updating schedules, um, uploading headshots to rosters, um, making graphics for our video board and so on. So doing things like that, you don't need to have the student there in your office uh, if they're, you know, they need help or, you know, want your opinion and stuff. You can, you can talk with them on the phone or text them or uh, however, you know, best you communicate with that student, but they can do that remotely if they're comfortable and have only an hour in between classes. Um, they can do that, you know, in some sort of student lounge. They don't have to be in your office and maybe they're night owls and they, they like to finish up this, you know, they have a hint of creativity coming in at 10 o'clock at night and they want to, you know, do something really quick, you know, empowering them to do that um, and putting that trust in them to get the work done has really, you know, been a, positive uh turnaround for us and getting all those all those menial tasks done that you know maybe we all can do here on this call but having that help by the student worker and then giving them that experience uh is very beneficial amelia tell tell us a little bit about uh your office hours with the students and what they do outside of a game day yeah um so for us um, we're trying to get back into uh, having mandatory office hours for our students um, during COVID. Our student program was kind of pivoted to just being game coverage. Um, so we're hoping to kind of bring it back to what it was beforehand with um, hopefully one day, you know, being able to give some students um, sports for themselves and having them be primary contacts. Um, so what we're hoping then to learn from office hours is kind of who's really invested in, you know, doing this and who's got the skill and, um, you know, the motivation to um, actually take on a sport. Um, so when they come in for office hours, they're doing anything from, um, you know, IDing photos from uh, the weekend before. Um, they're helping with, you know, maybe updating some stat sections of game notes, um, or we sometimes have them working on um, longer term projects, longer term research projects, whether that's, you know, helping to improve a media guide or a record book. If, you know, maybe there's a section that we've seen in, you know, some other schools that we want to copy for ourselves, but don't necessarily have that information um, gathered in one place. So uh, we'll kind of lean on them to help with those when we don't necessarily have time to do that um, during the year. So there's a wide a variety of things. I know um, right now, you know, I've got some of my students, uh, punching out credentials for the football game this weekend. So uh, it ranges from, you know, the mundane kind of IDing photos to, um, you know, maybe helping out on a player of the week uh, release or, or things like that. Just uh, kind of gearing it again towards uh, what maybe they're more interested in, whether, you know, we've got some kids who are journalism students and want to do some more feature writing. So um, some of them will come in and we'll have them doing, you know, Q&As on student athletes. Um, so they'll they'll work on those during their office hours or some of them are more more stat focused. Um, so again, we like to kind of cater those uh, responsibilities and projects towards what they're interested in. But we also have, as we kind of mentioned on that, um, the Google Doc, uh, we have a list of, you know, things to do. Um, so SIDs will go in each week or, you know, as they think of it and put down things or projects that they need some help with. Um, and then as students come into the office, they kind of have an idea of who needs help and they can go to that person and uh, help out with those projects. So if you have a student that does really well in year one or two, will will Ohio State or you allow them to be a contact for a sport then during their time? Yeah, so we have um, probably about, you know, six to eight sports that we'd um, ideally like to give to students um, going forward. Um, again, we're trying to get back into, you know, hiring with the intention of giving a sport to students, um, not just covering on game days. Um, so that has been a little bit of a progress or a, a process right now. Um, but yes, we do have, um, you know, six to seven that, you know, when I was a student at Ohio State, I don't know, it was probably about five or six years ago now, um, I had a couple of sports um, and I was able to, you know, breathe, be the primary contact on on those sports. And, you know, since I've left and with COVID, haven't necessarily been able to do that, but we're now trying to bring it back to that. Um, so, I mean, right now we have, even if it isn't one of those maybe six or seven that we typically give to students, um, if there is, you know, a student who's interested in working more with another sport and the SID is able to um, kind of offload a, some of the day-to-day -day responsibilities of that kind of stuff, we will. Um, and then that helps in, you know, the crossover seasons where, um, you know, if 
for example, Gary in our office has to be at a men's basketball game, but he also has men's tennis and can't be at the match, then that student that's been helping him out can can be the the contact on site for men's tennis. So Brian, at your level at NAIA, uh, you may not have office hours for your student workers, but what are some of the things that you give student workers to do instead of coming into the office to work? Right, like I said, we're pretty small. So I mean, some NAIA schools are, you know, 27 sports, wherever you want to call it. And they have a bunch of student workers and they have all the, all the bells and whistles and it's great. But here, you know, seven sports like i can i can handle it like not to toot my own horn but i can handle that um but like for media day let's say for example i'll have students come in for media days especially for basketball because if i'm setting up a an area to take headshots and and pictures for graphics and then i have a green screen set up with another camera and then we have the kids over here making tiktoks or whatever they do these days you know like i'll have a kid at each station you know kind of keeping them in route because if you if you don't keep students you know, if you don't keep them like on track, then they're just going to leave. You know, if they're, if they're not doing something, they're going to get bored and leave. So you got to keep them on track. You know, you get them from station to station. And then when they're done, hey, that's great. And, um, you know, some other some other tasks we might have them do, you know, let's say we're giving out free T-shirts at the basketball game. Let's say it's a pink out for breast cancer awareness or whatever. And we need to roll, t roll 200 T-shirts. You know, well, I'll have a couple students come in, roll those T-shirts and then get them ready and then you know, other things, you know, like, like Amelia said, I'll probably have a couple of kids who are interested in the stats and want to help me with game notes or media guides or whatever I have, you know, if they want to update those and that'll save me a, a little bit of time, then I've got no problem turning it over to them. But yeah, we, we kind of have to find things for students to do outside of game day, but you know, however they can help, it's great. Before we move on to our, our next section, uh, we had a question come up on how do we pay these, how do you structure and pay these student athletes? Uh, some of them, one school has, they, they have an Olympic sports where they have uh, five contacts, but how do you pay these student athletes? Do they clock in, clock out? They work from home. Uh, what are their paid hours, unpaid hours? How do you work with that uh, at Ohio State, Amelia? Yeah, so our students get paid, you know, the state minimum wage. Um, for uh, each event, we let them kind of clock in on when they get there and when they leave. Um, for longer events like football games, we'll give them, um, I think it's a five-hour time block. You know, they they get there three hours early. We're not necessarily going to let them, you know, get nine out hours out of us that day, um, but we'll give them five for for working a football game. Um, and then we do um, have the opportunity to um, give an elevated pay. I think it's maybe $2 more an hour uh, to students who uh, maybe do have more responsibility. Again, we haven't uh, necessarily gotten to that point yet where um, we're giving, um, you know, a, a sport to a student primarily, um, but hopefully in the future, um, we'll be able to do more things like that to hopefully incentivize people to take on some more responsibility in the office. And that's one of the things I do with our student workers, uh, creatives and things like that, that help on uh, outside of game days is they'll clock in and clock out if there's a video shoot or or a photo shoot that they do, or they're helping one of our uh, uh, GAs on a, on a project, they'll clock in and clock out and keep track of their hours that way. And uh, that way they're getting paid their time outside of, of game day. Um, Alex, do you have anything to put in on, on how you pay your students or structure for that? Yeah, I mean, pretty much all the same. Um, I'm going to I'm going to hope that none of the student workers here at WPI heard anything about the uh, advancement in pay at Ohio State. But uh, yeah, so basically, I mean, kind of a, what Amelia said was, you know, the more that students show that they're really committed to this job, I mean, they might not get paid more, but they might be able to get the chance for more hours and more responsibility. So instead of showing up an hour before a game, uh, maybe it's two hours before a game to help out with extra setup, bringing stuff out to the press box or, um, you know, and then in that case, like if you're really into making graphics and you really like it and you're committed to something, um, I, I have plenty of student workers that come and they're, they're like, yeah, I, I really, you know, like making graphics. And 
to an extent, uh, everybody can say that, but if you want to do something to make it consistent and let's make something that's sustainable um, and feasible, you know, for time frame. So, you know, if it's an extra two hours a week of working on graphics, that's, that's something where those opportunities to be paid more uh, overall would uh, come in, but you still have to do the work. But in terms of the actual pay rate, I mean, we, we target our uh, federal work study pretty heavily at our um, career fairs or job fairs. Um, and then some really, you know, we, we really have to knock it out of the park with getting our uh, department funded uh, student workers that aren't federal work study um, trained and very quick. <laughs> we can, you know, bring them in and they're solid just as much as the others. Another question come in, does anybody do any professional development hours with, with students to help them in their career as they leave, but also while they're working for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start out on that. Something that I've uh, implemented with my student staff over the last couple of years is checking in with them after every term, uh, which kind of lines up with the start of a season, crossover season, and then fully into the next. So um, we're kind of lucky where I just have them kind of reflect on what they've been able to dive into during a particular season and throughout sports and really get a grasp on where you know, they really excel where they want to improve. Um, and then maybe some areas they really want to stay away from, uh, which, you know, it's just as important to know what you like to do as it is to what you don't like to do. Uh, so that I get that reflection, I get that chance to work with that student, or all the students uh, to really put them in a place to succeed and really take on more responsibilities. And then at the end of the year, you know, something to work on for the summer. Uh, that they can do just in their own time. So, you, you know, WPI, we're a STEM school, but we've had a couple people that are crazy enough to go be interns at a, uh, with a summer sports league in some sort uh, here in Worcester or back near home or something like that. So it's kind of a, kind of a unique outcome seeing that, but with those students that really take it that seriously, you, you can see the passion in them. And so that extra conversation, that extra of uh, leap of faith to give them a little more responsibility really gives them or puts them in a position to succeed and, uh, you know, go on from there. We've got about 10 minutes left and two more sections to hit up uh, real quick. Uh, Emilia, first, uh, briefly tell us a little bit about your handbook that you have for students that uh, work for you. Yeah, um, as was uh, kind of touched on it a little bit uh, earlier, but it starts with just those general protocols um, of our, uh, technically our floor over at um, our office building, but it's all those uh, departments like marketing, um, fan experience, uh, digital, video, all that kind of stuff, outlining things from uh, dress code, credential policy, you know, no taking, if you're going to take photos down on the field on a football game, fine, but, you know, make sure that credential is turned around and no one can see that. Um, just all general things like that. Um, and then it goes into um, some more specifics to our role, uh, things like um, our AP style guide. Um, we include that at the end there so that students who are doing any writing for us, whether it's uh, on social, on the website, uh, game recaps, game notes, uh, anything like that, they have um, a reference for not only just general AP style uh, guidelines, but also things that are um, or style points that are specific to Ohio State. Um, so we have that as a reference to them there. Um, and in it, it has all of our contact information, um, all the sports that each SID is assigned to, and also just uh, those game day responsibilities, whether that's uh, calling for stats, uh, where to take um, stats at halftime, post game, um, you know, anything kind of like that gives a brief overview of all those things, where to go on game days, uh, which facility, because, you know, sometimes people don't know that, you know, the women's hockey team doesn't play at the shot. They play over at the ice rink. So just little things like that to make sure that, you know, a student is uh, as prepared as they can be uh, for a game day. So um, definitely looking to add a little bit more to that handbook as it sort of starts to evolve. Um, but yeah, basically it's just kind of, general protocols of the of the role and um you know the expectations of the role and maybe the consequences that come with not um following those those protocols um as well as um just you know general game day responsibilities and then that style god 
Thanks for sharing that with us and letting us know more about what you do there. Uh, as we move into our final session here, what do you what do you guys do to empower your students working for you? I know one of the things I do here with my creative students that work is we when they're when their work is used on our social channels, we tag them on Twitter or X, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, anything, TikTok. We, we tag them to show that this is their work and then they, they use it on their channels too. And we're empowering them and showing them their work. Uh, Alex, tell us a little about how you empower your students. Yeah, I would say, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's uh, getting them to realize the the bigger picture to everything that we do as college sport communicators. Um, and that's to tell the story. And you can tell it in hundred different ways. You can tell it with a photo after a goal and the celebration. You can tell it with a, a preseason hype video. You can tell it with a correct box score uh, and a good story. There's so many ways to tell that story. Um, and and I'll add to the, the broadcasting, managing a good stream. Uh, all of those things uh, really for one event or five events in a day, they all matter so much uh, for what we do daily and getting the students to see that and how important that is um, really gives them that feeling of empowerment. And, and from what I was able to hear in reflections with the student uh, student workers and, um, you know, if they don't see the importance behind all of it, I mean, it's just going to work and clocking in and clocking out and going home. Um, it's just, you know, some extra money that you can make in between classes or something like that. But uh, having some really committed students uh, to this to this industry and to uh, our product that we put out. I mean, uh, the, the bigger picture is what keeps a lot of them going every single day and, and no matter what position they do and no matter what they do from any sport. Brian, what do you do? Yeah, I, I really try to make the kids understand that they're important and that and that I have the utmost trust in them to get the job done no matter what, because as long as they feel like you trust them, then I think they do a much better job than if you just are always criticizing what they do. Oh, you missed a rebound. You stink at your job like that's Everybody's going to miss something. Everybody's going to have those moments where I had something just slipped my mind. And I mean, just having that welcoming atmosphere in the office and on the court at the field, wherever you are, you know, trusting them, making sure that they know they're doing a good job because at the end of the day, you know, not every student that we hire is going to end up becoming an SID or a college sports communicator. That's not realistic, but you try to find the one or two that you can really impact and say, Hey, this, this job is not easy, but it's so rewarding and so fun. Like Alex just said, you get to tell the story. I love that. I love that. He just said that, you know, you get to tell the story, no matter what you're doing, if, if you're the camera one operator at the basketball game and all you're doing is following the action, you're telling the story. You could be selling tickets, but you're telling the story by selling tickets. I love that. So, you know, we're trying to empower kids to, you know, it's important to have a college job anyway, to learn some responsibility while you're away, especially 18 to 21 year olds, to learn how to manage a little bit of money, get a job, learn what you're going to have to do for the rest of your life is get up and go to go to work. You know, you got to they got to learn how to do that at some point. So as long as you're nurturing and and empowering them the whole way, then they're going to turn out to be very successful. Emilia, what you do there at Ohio State? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, a lot of very similar things to everyone else has said. But um, for us in our position, our kind of motto this year is been kind of, you know, choose your own adventure. You know, um, if you are one of those kids that wants to come in and, you know, just work game days and is just someone who's, you know, interested in athletics and um, is just looking to make a couple extra dollars, then you know what, sure, um, we need those kids. You know, we need kids who are going to show up on game days and help us with that stuff because our game day operations don't run without them. So um, we make sure that that's communicated to our students and know that, you know, whichever adventure that you take with us, whether it is just working on game days or it is, um, you know, coming in and, uh, you know, putting more work in with a sport to hopefully become a, a primary contact for a sport, um, whatever it is, um, without you, we wouldn't be able to do our jobs. Um, so that's definitely something that we like to tell them often uh, because it's true. Um, so it just kind of helps them, you know, feel 
recognized and feel needed. Um, again, going back to that sort of retention thing that we I talked about a little bit earlier, um, it's important for them to feel like they're needed and feel like they are doing an important job because um, it makes them want to keep showing up. Um, and then kind of a little bit on um, just empowering them, but also kind of back to that um, professional development stuff. Um, we'll pass, a lot of times we get, um, or the conference will come to us looking for, you know, students or um, volunteers to help at, um, whether that's, you know, basketball tournaments or any kind of championship event, things like that. Um, and so then with that, you know, we make sure to always pass those along to our students because um, it is kind of an extra reward or an extra experience that, that they get to um, maybe be a part of because of the work that they're doing in our office. So uh, we do our best to try to pass along any of those other opportunities outside of our office um, because, uh, you know, people are reaching out to us because they've had good experience with our students in the past. Um, and, you know, we hope to then be able to give our students or continue to give our students some of those experiences. All right. Thank you to our staff today. We'd like to give a big thanks to our presenters today and Alex, Bryant, and Amelia for their discussion and insights on building a student staff. Again, this webinar will be on demand later today. So share that information with your colleagues. We encourage you to check our website, college communicator, college sports communicators.com for updated information on what's on tap for the CSC programming and continuing education. Thanks again for being with us today and we will see you later.